we finish our series, Wrecked, um, this morning in Psalm 51, uh, probably the most well-known of all of the penitential psalms that we've studied. Penitential is just a big churchy word for I'm sorry. Um, There are psalms that we have categorized um, that have that theme in them, that the author has recognized sin in their life. God has brought sin to the attention of the author. The author is wrestling and grappling with the weight of sin, the guilt of sin, the shame of sin, the consequences of sin, but then confesses that sin, turns from that sin, repents of it, and sees restoration. That is a basic theme of what we find in the penitential psalms. And we have walked, not through each of these psalms, but we have walked through many of the penitential psalms, and we've really gone to the depths with the author. We have shaken under the weight of conviction with him. We felt the weight of God's chastening, disciplining hand on him. We felt the loneliness with him when all of his friends had left him and only his enemies were nearby. This morning, we get, like last week, we got to rise up with the psalmist when he realized that that heavy hand of God that was upon him, upon confession and repentance, was lifting him up again and strengthening him. And this morning we ask ourselves a question, what do we learn? What are some of the benefits that come from being wrecked? What are some of the benefits that we can expect and anticipate in our life as a result of confessing and repenting of that sin? Psalm 51, as you'll see in the introduction, it's, it's written to the choir master, a psalm of David, when Nathan the prophet went to him after he had gone to Bathsheba. This is a psalm written again out of the soil of David's sin of adultery with Bathsheba and murder of her husband Uriah the Hittite. And we ask ourselves, God, when we're in these painful seasons because of our sin, what can we expect? And I hope this morning as many of you have been kind of traveling and journeying with us on this uh, these, through these penitential psalms, I hope this morning for those of you that have made significant life decisions as a result of God's working in your heart through this series, I hope this morning that you are encouraged to grab a hold of these next steps. These things that David saw are not just for David alone, uh, but they're for us as well. You see, I think oftentimes when we have been in a season of dealing with sin or uh, struggling and burdened under the weight of sin, really the, the most important thing we can think of is that we want to feel better. We want that weight and that burden. We want that conviction. We want that guilt to be removed. And no doubt, that's a great, that God offers that. Praise God. He can remove the shame and remove the guilt and He can lift up our heads Um, Thank God He does do that, and He does restore us. But sometimes we set our our goal to just feeling better or being out from under it. But David lifts his eyes up and shows us something that lies even beyond the restoration. Better yet, that is a result of the restoration that God brings to our lives. So for those of you that have made significant decisions in your battle over sin in your life... I hope this morning that we will lift our eyes up and see the long view of what God wants also to accomplish as a result of the painful season of conviction in our life. And I want to start in verse number 4. David says, Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment." Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. He's speaking about our sin nature. Verse 6. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Look at verse 16 and 17. For you will not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You will not be pleased with the burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit and a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. Let's take a look at three things this morning. The first one is this, David has learned something. Now for all that we, all that we have to pay 
for the tuition of that season in life, don't you want to get as much as you possibly can out of it? David realized that even though that was an incredibly painful season in his life, a a very painful uh, length of months where he was burdened under the weight of his sin and had yet to really deal with it as God sent Nathan, when we're looking at this, we have to be able to realize that David was awesome in that during that pain, he was able to learn some things about God. And if you think about it, several of the penitential psalms begin with this phrase, Lord, do not discipline me in your hot displeasure. Think about that. When these penitential psalms, some of them when they open, it is a cry out to God that, God, I'm worthy of discipline. You you deserve, I deserve the discipline in my life, but don't do it from anger. See, the psalmist realized that when God is angry, that's a powerful thing. And he's saying, God, I deserve to be disciplined, but don't don't discipline me in your anger or you'll totally wipe me out. But in those penitential psalms, he says, do not discipline me. Parents, what is the purpose of discipline when we discipline our child? It's to take things away from them, right? It's to make their life miserable, right? There's a yes over here on this side. And a no on this side. No, no, no. We discipline our children because we want to teach them. It is an act of love on our part. We want them to learn. And learn David did. I mean, being pressed all the way down to the ground, being afflicted physically, mentally, spiritually, emotionally, in every way, being emptied and laying down on the floor. He gets up now in Psalm 51 and says, hey, I learned something. What did he learn? Look at verse 6. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. He learned that God places an emphasis on the heart rather than the hands. He realized through this moment, God, what happens out here is not as important to you as what takes place in here. The contents of my mouth are not as important to you as the content of my heart. And you see, if there's anybody in the Bible that should have known that, it was King David, who has been called a man after God's own heart. Do you know the scripture that is attached to David when he was called or anointed as king, as the youngest son of Jesse? The scripture that was attached was that God looks at man's Though all of the other brothers looked more kingly and looked like they would be a better king, God chose David because God wasn't looking at man's hands. He was looking at David's heart. And David being flat on the floor, he gets up and he's writing this psalm and he says, God, I've learned, I know that you place a vital importance on my heart over my hands. You look at what is real rather than what the appearance is. You see, God had to do that. God had to take David all the way down to the bottom. Because once God got David all the way down, emptied and poured out, laying down on the ground, pressed down by the hands, David was then able to see his heart more clearly the real you and I is not here the real you and I is not here the heart is where the real you and I reside and we don't like to visit the heart we don't like to question our heart we don't like to to open up that manhole cover and look down in there because we know that's the real us we don't want to fix our heart We don't even want to look at the errors of our heart. You know why? Because it's hard to fix. We can fix our hands. We can put on a show and we can put on a mask and we can say all the right things and we can be in all the right places and seemingly do all the right things while having a dirty heart. David said, David's son, Solomon, 
said these words. In the book of Proverbs, he says, Guard your heart with all diligence, for out of it flow the issues of life. The word guard is a military term. What Solomon was saying is protect that heart because from that heart, all the issues of life come from it. You see, if the headwaters are not pure, then all of its tributaries and streams will be tainted as well. David says, God, I learned something. And what I learned is that you value my heart. You value the inner man more than you value my hands, my words, my feet. He also says in verse 16 and 17, God, you will not delight in sacrifice or else I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. Sacrifices of God or a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, oh God, you will not despise. Don't you know that if there was a sacrifice reserved for adultery, if there was a sacrifice reserved for murder in this sin, Don't you know King David could have offered thousands of head of bulls and goats? He could have brought in livestock from all of the country. He had the wealth and the resources to keep that altar with the blood of bulls and goats for days or weeks or months. He could have supplied more animals on that altar than anybody else at that time. And yet what he says is, God, it's not about the bulls and the goats. It's not about the the sacrifice. It's not about the burnt offering. God, it's something deeper than that. What you want is the brokenness in my life. What you want to see is me flinging myself on that altar in brokenness, in sorrow, in repentance, in contrition. You don't want me to just see this animal killed. You want the death of my old man. David realizes if you look in verse 6 and 16 and 17, he speaks about God's desire. He knows, God, you want, you desire, you long to see righteousness here. He says, God, I know that it's not just the act of sacrifice or the burnt offering. God, you want me to live my life as a sacrifice. He learned the heartbeat of God. He learned something about God. Of course, we know through, these, through this series, we learned that he realized out of the depths I've cried to you, O Lord. He knew that there was never a, pl- a spot so low that he could go that God would not hear his cry. He knew there was not a sin so gross that God would still not freely forgive. He knew that God would not turn his back on the heart that sought God. So many powerful lessons David learned and, de- and revealed to us through the penitential psalms. I want you to see verses 11 through 13. He didn't just learn something, but he wants to teach something. Verse 11, cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit, then I will teach transgressors your way. And sinners will return to you. Then I will teach transgressors your ways. And sinners will return to you. David asked God to create in him a clean heart. Something only God can do. Another reason. It's hard. He asked God to renew a right spirit within him, both the heart and the spirit, the innermost part of man, the true part of who we are. He says, God, I need you to alter these. He says in verse 12, restore to me the joy 
of my salvation. Think about these words, church. Create in me. Renew. Restore. And uphold me with a willing spirit. Notice those things. Create, renew, restore. And in verse 13, then I will teach transgressors your way. And sinners will return to you. David is saying, God, I'm dirty. I'm deaf. I'm defiled. I'm distant. I'm depressed. I'm debilitated. All the D words. And God, he says, what I need you to do is to create, renew, and restore. And then, when you do this work in here, the innermost part, the part you're really concerned about, when you do that work in here, then I will teach transgressors your ways. You know, I said in the very beginning of this series, as we looked at his sin with Bathsheba, And later, the subsequent sin of murder with her husband. I told you that it's hard for us as believers to process a man like David doing those things. And we wrestle with that. And I told you that it's going to be easy for us to see him in a negative light. But let me say something to you about this man whose prayer journal we've been investigating now over the last four weeks. When you and I sin, one of the last things we want is for anybody else to know about it. We come to a place where we're okay That God knows. But when we start thinking about coming and sharing our story. Or testifying of God's forgiveness of that sin in our life. Do we not all have one of those? Let me just go off script for a minute. Is there not a sin in your life right now in your heart? And I, I wanna, I'm going to suggest in this story that you have taken care of that sin with God. Is there not something right here that if somebody else found out about it, you would be just, you would be mortified. You would do anything in your power to protect the secrecy of what you did. Let me ask you a question. Oh, well, let me say something. Where you and I want so much for our sins to be hidden from the eyes of other people. Do you see what David did? He crawls up off the floor. He grabs a scroll, parchment, and starts writing, yes, David was left-handed. And he starts writing out his sins. He starts describing the weight of God's hand. He starts describing painful physical ailments in his loins. He starts describing how he has no friends and he's moaning and groaning. Here this great and powerful and mighty king has demonstrated and revealed and communicated to everybody else. Not only did he sin, but how bad he felt. He comes and presents himself throughout these penitential psalms as a man who was weak. And then after he writes out all of this, he signs it to the choir master. I want this sung in church. That's teaching transgressors your ways. That's writing your prayer journal and pouring out your deepest, darkest wounds and hurts and failures. And then saying, let's sing this at church to a glory to God. 
You and I don't want anybody to know him. He put him on the marquee. That's the level of heart that this man had. When he says, I will teach transgressors their ways, yes, he meant it. He would pour himself out. He didn't care what people thought about him now. He didn't care how the truth portrayed him. All he cared about was that God would be glorified, that people would be able to see past the grossness of his failures and see the glory of God's forgiveness. That's what David wanted. He was willing to go to people who were on that same path and say, you know what, this is how that's going to end for you. I know because it happened to me. He was willing to use his story as a teaching tool. He says, I will instruct you. Psalm 38, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. We want them hidden. David wanted them communicated because he knew he wasn't alone. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, not his ways, God's ways. And sinners will return to you. He knew those who were going down that road. He knew his story could be effective, effectual in bringing about repentance you see, that journey that you've been on, that painful season, that chapter in your life, is all a book that God wants to use to declare His goodness to others. He's learned something. He will teach something. And number three, He will praise God. Look at verse 14, please. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God. O oh God of my salvation and my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. O oh Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. It seems as though he even needed help here. He knew that he was experiencing shame. And he knew that that shame was going to keep his tongue from singing aloud. It's hard to sing to a great God when we're still shamed over what we've done. He knew, God, I need you to deliver me from this. Not just the sin, but the consequence that is my failure, my shame. And Lord, I need you to open my lips because when you open my lips... They're going to praise you. No wonder David could say, Blessed is the one whose sins are forgiven, whose transgressions are covered. Church, one thing the Bible tells us that many of, if not all of us, know is this. Is that we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, no, not one. We've all missed the mark. We live in a community and in a world where everybody has missed the mark as well. And even though everybody has missed the mark, there's still one thing that not everybody knows. And that is that Jesus saves. And what God wants to do through you and through me, through those of us who have experienced that flowing tide from Calvary. Those of you and I who have cried out to God from the depths and have heard Him and have known that He has heard us and forgiven us. There is a world that is dying to know that. Some know it and some don't. There is a world that is dying to hear the message of forgiveness. They have got to know and hear that it doesn't matter what you've done, how many times you've done it, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. I will praise. I will sing. If you were still wrestling and grappling with that sin, it was probably hard for you to partner and participate in worship this morning. You probably were still looking at the screen, reading the words, and maybe mouthing the words with no real meaning behind them. 
there's a difference, a huge difference between singing and praising. There's a huge difference between reading and proclaiming. I want you to, I want to close with this. Jesus tells a story about our relationship to him and how it relates with the forgiveness of sins. It's taken out of Luke chapter 7. It'll be on the screen, but I'm also going to read it if you want to join me in following along. Chapter 7, verse 36. One of the Pharisees asked him, Jesus, to eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. Behold, a woman of the city who was a sinner. When she learned that he was reclining at table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of ointment. And standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and wipe them with the hair of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. And when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would have known what sort of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answering said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he answered, Say it, teacher. A certain money lender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. And when they could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. Now which of them will love him more? Simon answered, The one, I suppose, for whom he canceled the larger debt. And he said to him, you have rightly judged. Then turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet. But she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not since ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. For she loved much, but he who is forgiven little, loves little. What Jesus is reminding us is that our relationship with him our response to him is in large part dependent on how we see his forgiveness in our life. How we see the debt of sin that we owe. We cannot deny that David did a horrible thing. But what he saw was a God who was willing to forgive him for even that. I don't know what you've done. I don't. But that sin that you don't want anybody else to know, let me tell you something. He forgives even that. And because of what Jesus did for us, you and I can place that on everything, even that. And when you and I, when we're talking about forgiveness of sins, I'm not just talking about a weight lifted off you. I'm talking about the freedom you have now. To realize this holy God you and I have sinned against has forgiven you and I and that ought to cause us to worship him and to love him so much more. When I'm not praising God, I think it's a declaration that God, I'm missing it. I'm not seeing how dirty I was. The good news is this. Jesus will forgive even that. If you've never taken that first step toward God, our journey begins with a first step. Before that first step towards God through Christ, we're sinful, we're separated from God. We're, he's holy, we're not. But 2,000 years ago, God, in a time that was appointed, sent his son to the earth to die on the cross to fulfill 
the law's demands. To be the perfect substitute and sacrifice that you and I could never be. And that in himself, taking the sins of the world upon him, he stretched out his arms and died, died dead as a sacrifice for me and you. And the third day, he was raised again to show that he was who he said he was and that that sacrifice was accepted. So that today, you and I do not have to walk with the guilt and shame of sin. So that you and I don't have to hang our heads low, but because of what Christ has done for us, we can learn, we can teach, we can praise Him. Our lives ought to be an overflowing worship service for the God who has changed our life and changed our eternity from that first step we took towards Him in faith. Friend, have you ever taken that first step towards God through Jesus Christ? I'm going to ask you today, if you've never done that, today's the day. The offer still awaits. These are the days of grace. And I'm going to invite you to come. Well, if counselors down at the front, I would invite you to come and tell them, I'm taking my first step to Jesus. You don't have to know all the words. You don't have to know all these churchy words you use. You come to our counselors and you say, today's the day. I'm taking my first step to Jesus. Hey, thanks so much for listening to our podcast at First Baptist Joplin. If you are interested in coming and worshiping with us live, we would love for you to come at 9 and 1030 on Sunday mornings.